Ready to go. All right, let's, let's start back in. I'm going to start in with the, the quotes again. I readily absorb ideas from every source, frequently starting where the last person left off. I think it's a great segue for this next session on domain management strategies, your foundation for a, an effective brand protection program. Of course, you have to think about where the last person left off. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Steve Coates, Senior Counsel for Amazon, and Elizabeth Brock, who's a partner at Harness, Vicky, and Pierce, PLC. And moderating today will be our all things, our queen of domain, Erin Baker. I know I should have backed that down. Our queen of domain, Erin Baker, who's our director of sales for Mark Honor for our domain business. So welcome, everyone. <laughs> welcome. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Hi. Is everybody still alive out there? Okay, good. Good response. Thanks. Um, okay, my name is Erin Baker. I am the director of sales for North America for uh, domain specifically um, for Mark Monitor. And I've been with Mark Monitor for six years and have been doing this for 20 odd years, which is a little embarrassing. Um, but that said, I'm excited today to be speaking with Steve and Elizabeth. They're going to give us some perspectives on some domain management strategies. Domain is, is a little bit of a tough sell, as some of, you, some of you all know, it's not the sexiest topic in the world, but it is sort of the origin story of a lot of abuse that happens online, and so I think it's worth at least touching on for a little bit. And Steve's gonna be able to give us an in-house view, and Elizabeth can give us an outside counsel view as well. And um, I really do think at this point in the day when everybody's really fed and fat and happy and tired and it's warm in here, the more interactive the better. So please don't necessarily wait till the end for Q&A. Please throw up your hands and somebody will run you a mic if you guys have some questions midstream. And with that, I'm gonna ask Elizabeth to introduce herself. Well, thank you. My name is Elizabeth Brock and thank you for referring to me as outside counsel as opposed to outhouse because- <laughs> Not outhouse. as well. <laughs> I work with Harness Dickey. We are an IP boutique firm. It's all we do. Um, we've been around for about 100 years, and we are top 10 in the nation for trademarks and top five for patents. But my favorite number is actually 1993, because that's when we registered HTP.com, which is a three-letter domain name. So Valuable. if we sold it, I've heard we could have some really good parties. Um, <laughs> but the sad part is that when our nerds registered that domain name, they didn't also pick up some of the ones that Doug was referring to that sold for so much that were available at the time, like sex.com. We missed such an opportunity. Another three-letter domain. Right? <laughs> so thank you for having me. Yeah, no, of course. Steve? Uh, my name is Steve Coates. Um, I wear two hats at Amazon. I manage uh, a, a team of uh, trademark attorneys and professionals who uh, manage our brands and copyrights and trade dress for our digital products and services. So things like Alexa and Echo and Kindle and Fire and Fire TV. Uh, and then crazy other things like IMDB. Uh, you won't believe the kind of um, lawsuits we have on that side. Um, <laughs> as well as uh, my other hat is um, managing the team that manages our domain name portfolio. I've been in trademark since uh, 1997. And um, in-house, I used to be, I was previously out-house in-house since 2011 when I joined uh, Amazon and I had a few years also as, as Twitter's first trademark counsel down in um, the Bay Area. When I came back to um, Amazon, I'm what's called a boomerang, I left and came back, um, they uh, gave me the news that I would be main managing the domain team on day two. Um, I came back for other things, of course, and I do those other things, but it was a surprise to me that I would be managing um, the keys to all of our live sites. Um, so I spoke last week uh, in London at the uh, so symposium, right? Mm -hmm. I can't get the name straight, um, about how to become an expert quickly. Um, and I used a Malcolm Gladwell quote of, um, it takes 10,000 hours to become an expert at something, so the argument goes. So if you're doing that part time, 20 hours a week, it takes you 10 years to become an expert. So. I had a big responsibility in managing some of the most traffic domain names. Um, how could I do it and become an expert and do it really, really well? Um, so maybe we'll talk a little bit about we, that. We will. 
We will. Actually, Steve brought up something really interesting last night because he was talking about his time spent in London. And I, I want to kind of run the same experiment for this audience and say, how many of you in the audience, show of hands, uh, has a role to play? Uh, you're participating in some way, shape, or form in terms of domain management for your corporation or your client. That's a good number. That is a good number. How, How many, many of you do it full time? Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. sorry. <laughs> you steal your thunder. How many of you do it full time, but that is your gig? Nice. Very few. Okay. How many of you lost a bet and you feel resentful that you have to do this? <laughs> I love domain, but I understand it's not everybody's gig. But. Most most people, it's it's you're, you're like the redheaded stepchild, <laughs> right? Like you you're stuck doing this thing as kind of an add-on to your duties. So many people are not super familiar with domain name management, but it's so important so integral to most of our businesses, whether it be a live site or providing a service or delivering an API or uh, serving up images or managing your email, um, so important. Yeah, so that kind of harkens back to what we were gonna talk about, which is that domain obviously isn't the sexiest topic. It's not as interesting as talking about marketplaces, for example, but it is the inception point for so much abuse that happens online. And in preparation for this discussion, some of the emails that we had exchanged last week um, really, you had spoken to it, Elizabeth, was the notion of, we used to just see simple infringements, be it you know, direct squatting or squatting with additional terms, and now it's far more sort of comprehensive and complex. So could you, you did a really good job via email. I wonder if you could kind of walk us through what you've seen sure, as the, sure. the evolution there. Sure, um, once upon a time, the problem we would see would be a typo squatted domain name with a pay-per-click website, and that was it, and that was the worst of our problems. And now when we see issues with clients, it's much more complex and also typically involves you know, spear phishing campaigns. One of the more popular ones we've seen recently is when somebody either registers a domain name that's off by not necessarily one letter, but one letter that looks like another, or it's just an email spoofing, and they've also done an attack on the client's um, website as well, and they've picked up their emails, and now they know who the customers are, they know what their invoices are, and they'll send an email from somebody who works for the company saying, hey, client, customer, you haven't paid this bill. By the way, we have a new wire information. Here's our bank information. And that's happened to a lot of clients. And so it, there's a lot that typically happens with domain. And then there's a fake LinkedIn page and a fake website. It's a lot. They do a lot of setup around trying to um, bolster the legitimacy of what is essentially a very cheap and straightforward domain name, but, mm -hmm. but by way of, like you said, it, creating sort of additional touch points that add validity, at least by appearance. Yes, it looks real. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things you had kind of touched on is this one character offer. It looks like the same character. I wonder if uh, anybody in the crowd has had this issue. Uh, Doug spoke to it in the domain breakout. We call them, I think it's homographs, right? Mm -hmm. I had to go back to middle school and remember all my, <laughs> <laughs> all my phrases in Latin. Uh, have you all had this happen with regard to your own brand or your clients' brands around homographs where you've got a Cyrillic B in there on eBay or something like that. I can show of hands if you've had run into that. Because if you haven't, you're probably going to at some point. It's pretty effective, especially if you're on a mobile browser, which increasingly people are. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that our keynote speaker spoke to this morning is not just the notion of those domains that you may not have registered proactively or that you may have to go out and get because somebody has done a typo squat or a homograph uh, sort of squat, but the idea that you can have your own domain compromise. And Steve, you spoke to the notion of these things may only cost you $20 a year, but the value associated with a single domain name can be extraordinary. Um, so I wondered if you could kind of talk to us about the security measures that are appropriate for your crown jewel domains and um, especially in light of things like DNS hijacking and registrar breaches, how you guys view that from Amazon's perspective. And you guys are a registrar yourselves as well, so. Correct. Um, yeah, so there's a, a few things there I think I, I can unpack. Um, <clears throat> in terms of domain registrations, I, I kind of bucketize things. And I, and I think that um, every brand has um, different challenges. Amazon has uh, an incredible online presence for customer-facing um, services, I'm going to probably register a lot of domain names around those service. So uh, we, we launch a new uh, a retail site, say in a, in a different country, we're gonna get a lot of um, typos and uh, misspellings and IDNs and um, all those types of things. And, and 
one of my colleagues on my team um, has a whole spreadsheet for kind of figuring out what those are. And, and we base them on uh, geography and um, how, how customer focused or facing this service is. Because um, what I put the most um, uh, emphasis on, uh, my top priority is protecting customers. Um, I like to joke internally with my business folks that trademark law is the most customer focused um, uh, legal practice, which I think it is, because we're all trying to prevent consumer confusion. And I take that the same way for domain names. So it's all about protecting the customer and justifying that price. And there's other things too. There might be names that I think the business might use in the future, and then there's opportunity names, and then there's uh, things like generics and, and things like that that would be nice to have um, if you can. Uh, Jeff Bezos has said uh, to, to our team that his biggest, one of his biggest regrets at Amazon is not buying enough domain names early on, because um, he, he did have the opportunity, much like, um, much like many of us who've been in the industry that long. Um, yeah, and yes, at we own exchange.com, and there's not a week that goes by where I don't get a ridiculous offer for it. In terms of security, uh, security is a huge focus of mine, and um, when I came back three years ago, we kind of sat down and made a plan. Um, and the plan is super important uh, for me. Number one, it helped me figure out um, who has the keys to our live names, who needs to know about when we have a service issue, how do we escalate those issues, um, uh, what happens under particular circumstances so we have a game plan. So I, I know exactly who needs to be called. We have an email alias for it, um, depending on what the, if it's a service outage, um, if DNS needs to be changed, um, who's gonna be managing the um, locking or unlocking from the registry. Uh, those are the types of things that I think about. Um, registry locks are super important, um, uh, but not all registry locks are the same. Uh, so um, many registry locks that are available at TLDs uh, are not 24-7. So if you have a service issue in the middle of the night and the registry won't unlock your name, you might have many, many hours. Um, also, there are um, registries like Egypt where, um, where DNS changes have to be made on notarized paper. Um, and it takes you know, six to eight weeks for that, that DNS to be updated. So you have to think about these types of things when you're putting together a live site uh, of what the business impact, what the customer impact will be. Um, and as we have new GTLEs, uh, a lot of those have terms of service that are not conducive to certain types of, of websites. So some TLDs have uh, whitelisted um, uh, takedown procedures. They'll cancel a name if there's uh, what's called infringing content, whatever that means, without an appeal process. Um, so knowing that you know, if you're gonna have, a, a, say, a, a website with user-generated content, like Twitch, for example, or Twitter, um, you're gonna know that that may not be the best real estate for you to uh, set up on. So every time we launch uh, something on a new TLD, um, I put together a, a security uh, assessment. I also work really closely with other teams uh, at Amazon. So uh, when I came back, I set up quarterly meetings with the DNS team, uh, what's called our information security team, and a few others, and we brainstorm. Um, hey, here's, a, here's something we're seeing, or here's where we'd like to see an improvement, or could we build this thing that doesn't exist yet? And because we all come at it from different perspectives, me more on the, on the legal, domain management and internet governance perspective, and them on more technical perspective or data privacy, um, we can sometimes come up with happy accidents. And so in London, I, I talked about um, uh, uh, don't, don't be embarrassed about asking lots of silly questions. And one example I can give um, uh, that's not privileged is uh, when I went to Twitter, um, I sat down with a few of the, the people, the business folks and legal folks, and I said, um, how do we catalog hashtags? And, um, and they, they looked at me like I was crazy. I just started asking really simple questions about hashtags. And the purpose was, I know what a hashtag is. I know that's created when a user types it in. But where is it stored? Because I want to know if we have an issue where we have to blacklist or whitelist a specific hashtag. How do we do that? What if we have a, a security issue or there's some terrible shooting like in New Zealand where we want to block that hashtag? 
I want to know who that person is and how we can do that. And so I think those simple questions um, sometimes uh, create better results, more understanding, and um, better cross-pollination of ideas. Well, I think that's interesting too, because, and I know that this may not be, I don't know if this would be applicable for you working with your, your um, client counterparts, but back in the olden days when I first got into this space, it was almost exclusively the domain, no pun intended, of legal audiences. And increasingly over the years, it's become far more of a security focus. And obviously marketing is always interested because they, they view it as a way to communicate with their audience. But when you find that triumvirate, I think is when you've kind of hit the sweet spot in terms of corporate domain management. And I wonder, since you're working with customers who are looking to outside counsel to support them in their endeavors, mm -hmm. Do you have a lot of way in from their technology teams or their marketing teams, or are you kind of left to your own discretion in terms of giving them guidance and saying this is our legal perspective and we think you should do this? It depends on the client and the issue. Um, most clients, depending on the size, uh, we're working with um, in-house counsel, legal, um, marketing, also web and security. And typically there is a structure or hierarchy of how things work. Um, and who can do what in an emergency, like Steve was speaking about, um, which is, I think, why when he was talking about like having a plan, yeah. it's really important to have a plan um, to not just be reacting to things as they come up because you might miss something, and it really calms you down and helps you get through all the steps if you've had a plan right from the get-go, both from domain management and choosing you know, what do we need to register at certain times when we're launching a new brand, how important it is, and also a certain plan and steps you take to analyze when something goes wrong, how you're going to address it, and how high it needs to be escalated, how quickly you have to deal with it. Yeah, it may not be as acute as what uh, Brian Krebs was speaking of this morning, but have your fire drill and run it regularly was one of the key takeaways I wrote down. Um, so, we talked about this last night at dinner a little bit that you do have sort of like some frameworks that you share with customers around best practices of this is what you, we think you should register, this is what we think you should ignore. And Steve, you kind of walked through some of yours. You're like, these are the countries and it depends on the brand. And can you walk us through kind of what, very high level obviously, mm -hmm. kind of what some of that framework looks like in terms of providing guidance for folks who may not know any better? Sure, sure. Well, it depends of course on who the company is, what they do. Are you primarily in the services field? Are you, are you a manufacturer? Um, where are you producing? Um, maybe if you have, and it also is you know, a balancing act between um, how much money are you willing to spend, all the money in the world, versus how much risk are you willing to take on? And that's also an internal function in a lot of ways with many competing interests even within the same organization. And so then let's say that you're, maybe you decide that you're manufacturing, you're in the US only, so maybe we're gonna focus on that, but we don't do business in China, but we know that's a key marketplace. We're gonna register it there anyway, and that's sort of on our checklist. So maybe we'll identify like the crown jewel um, trademarks that we have, certainly the ones that are focused on e-commerce sites, and those maybe you choose to register almost everywhere right. if your budget can afford that. Okay. I wanna take a quick, well, I'm gonna do a bit of a pivot here in terms of topics, so I wanna take a moment and say, does anybody have questions, questions, offer up questions? Tom, hold on, Tom needs a microphone though. Mm. Becky's coming. <laughs> I know Me you're too. loud, but the people behind you can't hear. Are we on? Just be loud. Yeah, so the question is essentially how do I manage uh, budget? Um, uh, budget for our domains does come from legal, uh, I sit within legal. Um, I work really closely with our team to, to monitor budget. Um, so, you know, when new GTLDs launched, we had to make the case and significantly increase um, that. Um, we, we do break it up by brand to some degree um, or legal owner or entity. Um, I use a lot of codes uh, to, we have a very large portfolio, so I have tier systems and, and that kind of denotes like how important essentially that, how integral that, that particular domain is for the business. So, you know, live sites, critical customer facing sites, then next tier might be 
um, business critical sites, not customer facing. The next might be like, you know, million plus dollar names. Um, and so those, that allows me to prioritize those. Um, and then I also have codes to uh, denote to, to different parts of the business. So uh, about a year and a half ago, we, we closed Quidzy, which is one of our acquisitions that managed a lot of uh, generic domains like diapers.com and soap.com. And, and so, you know, when we, when we close those types of businesses, it's easier for me to go and say, okay, well, here's, we're going to cull all these names because we don't need them anymore. And here's the ones we'll keep. Um, that's kind of um, the process. You know, we are, we're also a, um, a hosting service, um, and we have uh, hundreds and hundreds of server names. Um, I want to keep those server names. Those are, they operate, Route 53 operates and hosts and, uh, a big chunk of the cloud. Um, those are one of my top priorities in my job, making sure I have typos for all those server names. Um, not all those server names are in use, but I want to make sure that they're not dropped. A, a hosting service last year uh, dropped a, a server name uh, that they were no longer using. Um, but guess what? That server name was still listed on Who Is Records um, all over the place. Uh, a malicious person picked it up and started hijacking that information. Um, so I think about things like that um, in terms of should I drop something? How much should I you know, keep? Um, yeah. Any other questions? So I think the question is, um, do we have a, 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 a strategy for managing, say, international aspects of our domains? No, he said the time to live on the DNS. Oh. So that for live sites, that would be managed by the DNS team, and I'm not I'm not familiar with what processes they have. Um, so for, for the, the vast majority of our names, we'll use um, uh, registrar uh, servers. Sometimes we'll set up redirects. Um, I, I monitor, the traffic information is important to me. So um, I, I monitor traffic um, in terms of, of how, many, how many calls, say, for example, so that I can value domain acquisitions that I'm considering. Um, I also have, um, we have what's called an Amazon and Associates program where you can set up websites or, or apps and things and um, link off to, to items on Amazon and then they'll get a share of revenue. Um, well, I have a big chunk of our portfolio that's using the Associates program, not for revenue, but for measuring how valuable that domain is from a revenue perspective. So I'll use that associates data as just a, another data point to help me decide um, how valuable uh, should I keep it? Uh, is it one that's not getting a ton of traffic? Some of the domains we have are, get surprisingly massive amounts of traffic. Most of the time I can figure it out, sometimes I can't. Um, and those are, those are ways that I use that. So the, the question is, do we have any um, uh, tools internally that are not publicly available um, that we use for, for metrics? Uh, the question is no, but that's my North Star, and I do have some ideas. Um, <laughs> and because uh, I think the, the, um, the magic tool that I want is I can just plug a domain name, and it's not like Estebot, many of you probably use Estebot, and it gives you like what they think the domain name is worth. But the domain uh, metrics that I want to know is, is a little bit more than just valuation. I want to know about traffic. I want to know about SEO. Um, uh, yeah, a little bit more. And specific to Amazon, for sure, too. OK, so um, I got a lot of my thunder stolen in the domain breakout session. So there were some things on my notepad that I was going to cover that we're not going to cover. But one of the things that we didn't talk about in the domain breakouts that I know, Steve, you had mentioned that you have some issues with, but I'm curious to know if you have customers who are having the same problem, is China and how much fun they are uh, with their rule changes and uh, the difficulty of maintaining live websites within the Chinese market. So I don't know if you guys want to speak to that 
quickly. And I, I don't know, you know, in the case of how many customers you're, you're working with, I don't know if they have current live sites in China or not, but I think that they do. We, we do. Okay. And over the years, it's been, you know, going back and forth with China where you have to have somebody living there who owns a domain name and then it's not and back and forth. But mm. really, I think, I think Steve could probably answer this question a lot better than I can. China is a pain in the ass. Um, so uh, to, to like boil it down really simply, um, live sites in China have to be registered to a Chinese approved registrar. Uh, so if you have a, a, a live site in China that is providing services to Chinese customers, you have to be licensed with MIIT. Uh, I believe it's called an ICP license. And the license uh, requires uh, audits and certain um, uh, functions. So if uh, the domain must be registered to through a Chinese registrar, Mark Monitor has um, worked with a, a local registrar to help manage names. And that's what we use right now to manage our names. So we have some control, um, with some direct contact with the registrar. Um, they also require that the who is uh, uh, publicly be uh, connected to the, the Chinese uh, joint venture. So uh, you have to have a JV, and the JV has to be the actual owner of the domain name. The problem with that is control, right? So you, you may not control the domain name, you may not control the registrar. Um, the processes that they uh, give change. Um, uh, you get new requirements depending on um, where what um, uh, province um, you're, the, the agency, at, at me, the MIIT agency you're doing. And then on top of that, certain other industries have additional regulatory requirements. Um, so uh, cloud, we, own, we operate a, a cloud service in China. And uh, there are even additional um, uh, uh, things that you are required to do that uh, provide you less control of your assets. Um, and so that's the challenge of, of balancing uh, issues in China. And things are super slow. So if you want to launch or uh, update DNS in China, it, it, it doesn't take uh, days. Sometimes it's taken weeks for us to get it operating properly. Yeah. Is this the same thing for Hong Kong as well or different? Nope. No, it's Hong totally Kong different. Hong Kong is not the same at all in terms of domain registration. So that no, you wouldn't face the same issues in Hong Kong at all. And, and Chinese is uniquely difficult. Or China is uniquely difficult. That way, they also and the worst part is they move the goalposts as well. So once you've achieved one thing, I mean, it's just like China with everything else. You think you're there, and then you're like, no, you're not quite there. They, if I'll, I'll just add, they also limit the number of TLDs that you can um, you can use under the license. Uh, and some of those TLDs may not uh, have enough servers uh, to operate the service quite the same way you, you want to. Um, so there's additional technical issues um, that you might have to overcome. Um, and I, that being said, you know, I, I, I have had some conversations um, uh, through my China team with MIIT and um, uh, CN Nick, and, and they have made some some changes uh, to be able to to get our, our technical requirements um, in conformance. But so that it hasn't been a one way door. But um, it's difficult. Yeah, it's very difficult. So. Um, I really am. I'm going to skip GDPR. I'm going to skip IDNs. I'm going to skip Brexit, which is my favorite thing to laugh about right now. And so I wanted to real quickly just kind of sum up with, because Becky's giving me the rap at time. Um, <laughs> I wanted to know what you guys think is one of the most critical components in terms of the partnerships you look for in order to manage your domains. Obviously, I think you guys both use Mark Monitor. Several people in the room do. There are others who do not. What are some of those sort of uh, qualifications that are really critical to you in terms of making sure that you're operating with a partner, not just a vendor, uh, as it pertains to your domain. Mark Monitor has been really great. Um, I think they've, um, uh, a lot of the people, I, I went to Boise, um, I had a couple days there, session with the, with the, the thought leadership there, and um, I think they would laugh if I said I, I peppered them with all those silly questions, like why are they, why are they called glue records? Um, just kind of going through all the, all the things, um, they've been really uh, patient uh, with helping me understand um, what Mark Monitor controls and what they don't, um, and um, how much of a how much more robust of a process we can get because we have a certain process that we've set up um, for them through them for for locks and unlocks and things like that. Um, so that's great. 
and not to poo poo Mark Monitor, but it's also good to have another registrar just in case the shit hits the fan. So you want to be able to diversify that. Uh, Route 53 is great. Uh, we work with Route 53, which is our own registrar, as well as Mark Monitor and, and others. But it's good to have that diversity, just like you want diversity of your DNS. I was just going to have to get the gong or the hook. Just kidding. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Oh, for us, I think it's been um, consistency and also relationships, not just the technical expertise. Um, our firm came over with you, I think, with um, by all domains back in the early 2000s. Oh, and we've been working with essentially one customer service rep, Joseph Jenkins, the entire time. So we're talking like 20 years with the same person. So in terms of knowing um, you know, when a client has maybe 10,000 domain names in their portfolio, and I can call him and he will tell me. He has records. He knows what we were doing, why, why we passed on something, why we chose something. Um, I really value those relationships. Joseph's one of the few uh, fellow employees I think I can look to who's been doing this as long as I have, and we laugh at each other about the fact that we're still doing this. Yes, he's wonderful. Uh, any other questions or any other feedback that uh, anyone might have in the room? Why did I skip So because I got the high sign from Becky, but yes, I honestly, the only thing that pertains for this audience, they probably had more meaning in the London Symposium about Brexit, but Obviously, the impact of Brexit, at least as far as I see, is that conceivably you may need to up be updating the information associated with your domain who is if you're utilizing London offices in order to meet local presence requirements in Europe. Um, in fact, I know that's the case for Mark Monitor ourselves, that we're having to update some domains. So I don't know if there's additional impact that I wasn't necessarily yeah, I mean, thinking of. No, I can't think of. Yeah, Brexit, not yet. It's, it's also an ever-shifting deadline, just like the, the, the ever-shifting goalpost with China. So I think it's one of those things where we're trying to be very prepared, but we don't know yet quite when it's going to come to pass. But. Any other questions? You guys were very patient with domain. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Well done. Thank you.